We ran aground yesterday, coming into Easton, and we had to sit there and wait for high tide, which for us, the tide was high enough at 1 a.m. So at 1 a.m. we floated off the bottom, and we started swinging on the anchor that I set earlier. So we simply pulled the anchor up, and then uh, just drifted in the last third of a mile, and then got here, close to town, and we dropped the anchor again. Had a bit of a rough start this morning. So we're going to shore because Maddie needs to sign up for her art competition that's tomorrow. But they're only available for signing up between 9 and 10 a.m. So we have to get there fast. The issues we've had, Ned. We couldn't find where to tie up the dinghy. And then Morty decided to go swimming, so I had to go get him, and in the process, I tumbled down this slippery ramp, so we had to go back to the boat, get band-aids and neosporin, and now we are walking with a wet corgi up one mile road, because we have no vehicle or mode of transportation. I should have borrowed your bike. It has flat tires. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I would have offered it otherwise. We are kind of stressed right now. So we're on Dover Street. Dover Street bisects the boundaries of the quick draw competition. So I have to find a place within this square to plan my plein air painting tomorrow morning. So we're going to walk around Easton within this six block radius and try to find a nice, quiet, shady spot that no one else will choose. <laughs> this is where we are now. We want to go into the limits of the thing, so let's try Harrison Street first. It's a scorcher. Well, I found, I kind of staked out a place to paint tomorrow. It's incredibly hot outside, 97 or 98 right now. And uh, we're gonna get lunch <laughs> at this cute little place. Yeah, it's called Bannigan's. Yeah. And they have outdoor seating so we can eat with Morty. <laughs> Yes, that's important. Yeah, Morty was a trooper. We had to hike all the way here. He's exhausted. My arms are getting tired. Yep. Back in April, I texted into a local radio station, Mix 106.5, that I listened to every morning on my way to work. And they asked me to call them because they were interested in hearing about our sailing trip story. So we did an interview on air and it went really well. All three of the hosts actually decided to follow us on our Instagram, Rigging Doctor, and they've been following us along and saw that we had left. And when they saw that, they actually contacted me again in hopes that we could do a follow-up interview and so they called me this afternoon and I talked to Katie Rose on Mix 106.5. It was super fun. It's gonna be on air and it's cool. <laughs> so if you're in Baltimore or Maryland tune in to Mix 106.5. Unfortunately I don't know when it's gonna be on the air so you know there's that. <laughs> but it's just cool to get the exposure. Morty's a little piggy. Yes. If you are worried about cruising, thinking that you'll get fat because you won't get any exercise, think again. The town of Easton is about a mile and a half from where the boat can get to. And we have no wheels, which means to go into town, we walk a mile and a half down this road. Yeah, this is rough. Yeah. There's no Uber here. It's such a tiny town. Yep. So you walk a mile and a half into town, you walk a mile and a half back from town. <laughs> yep, that's our exercise. Into the shade. He needs a break. 
His little legs are tired. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh. So after Morty relaxes, we will resume our forever walk back to the boat. It's super hot and the squirrel is keeping cool. Today we're gonna go over how to carry out a rig inspection. Now at the heart of all rigging, be it synthetic or steel, is always a clevis pin and a cotter pin. And these two very tiny and mundane things actually are the real workhorses that hold your rigging together. Clevis pin is simply a stainless steel cylinder that has a small hole in it and a head. Cotter pin is two split legs that have a head on them. Now you will notice with the legs that one leg is slightly longer than the other. With a clevis pin it always slides through a perfectly machined hole that is engineered for this specific size and it slides through that hole and is held in place. The cotter pin is simply then inserted through the little hole to hold the clevis pin in place and keep it from falling out. You always want to make sure that the head is up. That is so that when it slides into something, if for any reason the cotter pin were to fall out, gravity will keep it in the hole until you can find it and replace the cotter pin. The cotter pin, likewise, should also be always oriented head up. If you have it oriented head up, it'll hold in even if the legs aren't spread. If you turn it upside down, it comes right out. So when you're doing a rig inspection, you wanna make sure that all your clevis pins are set head up and all the cotter pins are also set head up. If your piece of rigging that you're putting a clevis pin through is perfectly horizontal, you don't have a choice of setting the head up because both sides are at the same height. In that situation, what you wanna do is make sure that the head is set inboard. That way, if it falls out for some reason, it falls into your boat and not overboard. The cotter pin, it's very simple, but very useful. Now you'll see a lot of people when they put them in, they'll spread the legs all around, even wrap them back up around themselves. That actually weakens the metal of the cotter pin and makes the legs more prone to breaking and then having a failure. You only wanna spread the legs at most 15 degrees. Now an easy way that I've found to spread the legs is you take a fid, you can push against that leg and that'll allow you to slide in between the legs. Once you're in there, you simply give it a little twist and that'll spread the legs ever so slightly so that way they'll hold in place. You can see one leg is pretty straight and the other leg is bent slightly. Now the reason you wanna bend them like that is you can then reuse these. If you're removing the cotter pin temporarily because you're just going to take it out, adjust something and then put it back, what you wanna do is you'll simply squeeze the cotter pin and then you can slide it out. The reason you don't wanna bend the heck out of them is you can reuse them if you're nice to them. So you get the long leg into the hole and then you just push the little leg into it and then it slides through and you can reuse your cotter pin. Now, this is very minor on the bending. You do want to bend them more than that. Uh, I just did a little bit because I plan on keeping this cotter pin. Here we have an example of a clevis pin and a cotter pin. Now you can see this cotter pin has been rotated. This is not ideal. See how the head is facing down? If these legs were to close, that cotter pin will fall out and then the clevis pin would be unretained. But you can still see that the clevis pin itself is oriented with its head up. Now, you can go around and spin all your clevis pins and cotter pins to get them perfectly oriented. That way all the cotter pins have their head up. But I can tell you, as you're sailing, your rigging moves and they will spin again and get back to where they are. I just personally rather go around and make sure that everything is in snugly and well. So here we have a cotter pin oriented correctly with its head up and the legs down. The legs are spread slightly. The clevis pin is oriented with its head up. Now if you have synthetic rigging, your next step is going to be a dead eye. And after the dead eye, you're going to have your lashing, which leads up to your stay. 
So no more clevis pins or cotter pins in the way on synthetic rigging. But if you have stainless steel rigging, in the place of this dead eye, you would have a turnbuckle. And a turnbuckle has two cotter pins in it. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Ideally, you don't want to use ring cotter pins because they have a tendency to fall out. At the same time, you don't want to leave your cotter pins with their legs pretty straight because they'll stick out and grab your legs or snag your sheets and tear everything up. So a lot of people will then take the cotter pin legs and bend them all the way around. That way they are still contained within the turnbuckle body. The problem is then you're stressing the legs. So it's, there's no right answer for the cotter pins in a turnbuckle. Uh, one option that I've seen that I actually like a lot is you take mousing wire and you'll wrap through the turnbuckle many, many times. That way you hold everything in place and there's nothing to snag your legs on. The problem with them is if you have to do a tuning, it's a lot of work to untie all that mousing wire. And a lot of times you can't reuse it. It's, it's too mangled up. This is a new dead eye that I put on about two years ago now. It's simply the Dyneema grommet held together by a seizing knot. And then you have the lashing and the stay. And instead of turnbuckles, this is what we have, so we don't have to worry about any form of corrosion. We just regularly inspect the, the toggles and ideally try and keep our cotter pins with their head up. If we don't have them with the head up, I just make sure the legs are spread well enough and that they won't fall out. And that is the basics of a rig inspection. So you always wanna start your rig inspection at the bottom where you check all your clevis pins and cotter pins, and then you simply work your way up the stays. As you go up the mast, you're simply gonna check the clevis pins and cotter pins at the lowers. If you have intermediates, you'll check those. In this case, we have check stays, and then you'll check the cap shrouds at the very top, along with the head stay and back stay. Aside from checking clevis pins and cotter pins, there are a couple other things you're gonna be checking during a rig inspection and they're mainly cracks and corrosion. Now, stainless steel doesn't rust per se. It gets more what they call crevice corrosion, which is little cracks that form inside the stainless steel and severely weaken it and eventually lead to a catastrophic failure where the stainless steel fitting actually snaps in half. There's very little warning, uh, but it is quite dramatic when it happens. So you want to be checking for these, that way you can catch them early. The things you're looking for are literally hairline cracks or little spider webs that run along the surface. That's, that's all the warning you're going to get. You'll see a little bit of black line running in a zigzag here and there on the stainless steel, and that's your warning. It's, it's, it's scary how tiny they are and how dangerous they are. If you have swadged fittings, you need to look for vertical cracks in the area of the swadge. Uh, that is caused by corrosion of the stay inside the swage, causing expansion, which then leads to a vertical fracture in the swage. If you have a horizontal crack, uh, that would be crevice corrosion forming. So if you have steel rigging, you want to check all your wires all the way up. There's 19 of them on each stay. There's a lot hidden in steel rigging. Uh, so you want to make sure that there's no corrosion or any raised wires or any issues of that sort as you go up. And then you want to check your mast fittings for any galvanic corrosion, which would look like little bubbling in your aluminum. Wherever steel meets aluminum, or stainless steel meets aluminum, you need to make sure that there isn't galvanic corrosion. So galvanic corrosion occurs between uh, any two dissimilar metals. And when you attach a stainless steel bracket to an aluminum spar, you are at risk of creating that issue. To avoid that, what you need to do is make sure there's an insulative layer between the two. Uh, that is done by the rigger at the time of installation and you hope they did that. Uh, if they didn't, you're gonna start seeing bubbling form right along this interface and a huge telltale is the paint will start to chip off your aluminum spar. Another thing that you'll see is this white powder that covers everything coming from that area. These are all signs of the beginning of the end for your connection and need to be fixed as fast as possible to make it a much less costly repair.
So rig inspection might seem complicated, but believe me, it, it's really simple. When you break it down, you are simply checking for cracks and corrosion, clevis pin and cotter pin orientation, and galvanic corrosion. That's all you're really looking for, and you're just making sure that everything is as it should be. If anything isn't, you just make note of it, and then you can assess everything at the end. Because, for example, say your clevis pins and cotter pins are not in their proper orientation, and you start worrying about fixing them, but your masthead fitting is severely corroded and the whole mast has to come out to be repaired. Who cares how your clevis pin and cotter pin orientation is? You're going to take the mast out and it's all going to come apart. If you frequently check your rigging, then if you find the cotter pin that's upside down, just keep an eye on it and be on your way. Go sailing, have a great time. Don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. It's Herbie's birthday tomorrow, so we're all celebrating and he just got a cupcake. And everyone's here, his parents, my parents, and his sister and brother-in-law, yay! Yes. Happy birthday, Herbie! I turned 31! <laughs> Next time on Sailing Wisdom, I participate in the Plain Air Festival in Easton, Maryland, and we find the perfect dinghy.